If you're a regular Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listener, please rate and review us on iTunes or using the podcast app on your phone. We currently have 994 five-star ratings, and it would be great to get that up to 1,000. And I want to give a special thank you to Archer Pilot, who just gave us this five-star review. Wow, this podcast has changed my life. I've been a sci-fi reader most of my life, and I'm a regular listener to Escape Pod, Starship Sofa, and other story casts. I've been stuck in a rut, though, trying to connect with contemporary writers and even some classics I've missed. Geek's Guide has filled that need perfectly. It is now my most anticipated weekly podcast. I've already ordered a copy of Daryl Gregory's short story collection, Unpossible. I've decided I do want to see The Green Knight. I learned more than I ever wanted to know about video game development. I read Behold the Man and found it fascinating. I discovered Robert Sheckley. I bought and devoured the best American science fiction and fantasy. David is one of the best interviewers I listen to on a regular basis. His ability to keep a group engaged and ensure everyone has their say without taking over the discussion is amazing. Keep up the good work. So big thanks again to Archer Pilot for that great review. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 486 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the movies The Neverending Story, Labyrinth, Lady Hawk, and The Princess Bride, and naming our favorite 80s fantasy movies. And this will include spoilers for all of those movies, so just beware of that. And we previously discussed 80s fantasy movies back in episode 77, 371, 379, 406, 413, 427, and 440. So definitely check those out if you miss them. And I'm joined by three guests who are all making their 20th appearance on the show. So first up, we've got Andrea Kale. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's been a television writer, producer, and script supervisor for shows such as Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Chew, and WWE's Monday Night Raw and Friday Night SmackDown. And she's currently shopping her reality show, The Night. So, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Tom Gerentzer. His short fiction appears in magazines such as Galaxy's Edge and in books such as New Voices in Science Fiction. He's the author of the business book, Think Like Google. And his short story collection, Intergalactic Refrigerator Repairman, Seldom Carry Cash, is out now. So, Tom, welcome to the show. It's great to be back. And also joining us today is Matthew Kressel. He's the author of the novel King of Shards. And his short story, Now We Paint Worlds, was just published on Tor.com. His second novel, Queen of Static, is available now on his Patreon page over at patreon.com slash Matt Kressel. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be back. Okay, so let's start off with Andrea. Yes. So, Andrea, what sort of history do you have with these four movies that we just watched? Uh, well, I've seen all of them. <laughs> um, like as a kid you saw them? or um, Probably all as a kid. Uh, some of them I've seen more than more than once. Um, you know, Princess Bride you, you, is possibly on everybody's top ten list of movies. I, I would imagine uh, Lady Hawk I loved as a as a probably a teenager, I guess. Um, Never Ending Story and Labyrinth. I wasn't. I've I've seen them both, um, but I can't say they were my favorite movies of all time. So you've you've seen Princess Bride how many times? Oh think? God, I couldn't even tell you. But I I hadn't twenty. Yeah, probably at least yeah, yeah. And then the the other ones just kind of like once or twice or I think well like that. I think I've probably seen Lady Hawk quite a few times. Um, okay. Back none of them I've watched recently, but I de- definitely remember watching Lady Hawk whenever it was on. You know, back when we had things like cable, um, <laughs> I would watch it anytime <laughs> it was on. Um, and the other two, I've seen once. That was it. Uh-huh. And how, how about Matt? What's your history with these four movies? Uh, well, I've definitely seen them all. Um, I've seen several of them or three of them many, many times. And, you know, I thought I had seen Lady Hawk all the way through, but rewatching it now, there were parts I really didn't remember. So if I had watched it all the way through, it was a long time ago, so long that I had forgotten a lot of the story. Uh, but yeah, Princess Bride, I've watched 
I don't know, at least a dozen times, Never Ending Story was one of those movies that was on HBO like every other day, um, at least when I was growing up. I feel like it was just always on, that and the sequel. And Labyrinth, um, which we can get into, yeah, I've, I've seen that many times. <laughs> Yeah, and so I'll see. I mean, I've seen Princess Bride definitely dozens of times. I mean, yeah, like like Andrew, maybe maybe twenty, thirty times. Yeah. I couldn't even say. I mean, definitely uh, for for a lot of my life, I would would have said I had the whole movie completely memorized. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, there's still I don't there's there's nothing in it that I uh that I'm like oh yeah I didn't remember that that line or that yeah. detail. Like I, I I know it pretty much by heart. Um, the never ending story I've seen a lot because. I used to go to this summer camp and whenever it rained, we would all have to go into the chapel and they would show movies. And this is like back in the days of VHS and they had a, you know, the library of VHS tapes was like eight movies. So you ended <laughs> up watching the same things over and over and over again. And, um, but, it, but it was, you know, it was always like, they would just kind of like start it wherever they had stopped at last. And so you, it was always kind of like confusing because you would watch different parts of it at different times and stuff. And I always thought the movie was like three and a half hours long. <laughs> and uh, so I was surprised to see it's It's like basically like 90 minutes, I think. Um, and I, I saw Lady Hawk once and I had never actually seen Labyrinth before. It's just one of those movies that everybody everybody's seen except i got i, I got left out somehow <laughs> although i do hate muppets so it probably <laughs> oh, has no. a lot to do with it uh but how about tom what's your history with these with these four movies i'm sorry my brain is just reeling because you said you hate muppets <laughs> <laughs> they creep I mean, me out i have like a muppet muppet phobia or something <laughs> That's pretty. That's pretty I've interesting. Talked, I've talked about it before on the show too. <laughs> okay, I wonder how many people have that because I don't. I've never even heard of that. I, I love Muppets, but uh, at least I know what not to get you for Christmas. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the Princess Bride, like everybody else, I've seen it. I couldn't tell you how many times. And like you said, Dave, I I could at one point in my life I could have recited the whole movie from by heart. Um, the others I had a varying experience with labyrinth i um had never seen when i was younger somehow i escaped it and then i was it was shown to me by um a series of women that i was dating as like oh you got to watch this movie <laughs> and and so i you know and, and i loved it like when i saw it i was like i can't believe i escaped this movie and now watching it again for this panel I was just like i don't know every time i watch this movie it gets better to me and i understand that you know you hate muppets and um, you know, other people have different reactions to it, but I absolutely love it. Like the more I watch it now, the more I love it. And um, and the never ending story, uh, same thing. I was shown that by one of the women who showed me the uh, Labyrinth movie. And that one, it was the first time I saw that was maybe 10 years ago. And I uh, I wasn't really impressed with it then. And I still am not. I think it has some really cool stuff in it. I think it's a it's a really cool allegory but and it has a lot of really fun cheesy stuff in it that i kind of like too but it's certainly not a movie that i'm going to go out of my way to watch again and lady hawk i had never seen until this panel and mainly because and apologies to andrea i had been told you know i, I saw it was it had a heavy ad campaign when i was in high school and i remember asking some of my friends like oh you, you know what do you think of that movie and they were like oh, yeah, i saw it it, it was kind of meh and so I was like, eh, all right, I'm not going to go watch it then. And I never did go see it. And now having watched it now, again, apologies to Andrea, I kind of uh, had the same reaction that my friends did. I was kind of like, <laughs> yeah, I can see why they said meh. But um, it has a lot of, again, that movie has a lot of great stuff in it, but we can get into why I, I don't ultimately like wait, it. Yeah. Wait, 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 yeah, let's... wait, wait, hold on one second. Did you say, I didn't say I was meh on Lady Hawk. No, no, no. You said you liked it. You've watched it oh, many, many... Oh, you yes. You liked yeah, it. Oh, you said you okay. watched it many, many, many times. And oh, I was yeah, like, yeah, okay, yeah. She, she clearly likes this movie. Oh, sure, sure. Wanna, okay. So I don't want to... Wanted you know. to just wanted to make sure everybody knows that. I do not... My reaction to Lady Hawk is not meh. <laughs> right. All right. Well, be before we get too into any of these specific movies, I guess I should... I forgot to explain kind of that we started off these this this string of panels just talking... They were like... For, at first, they were awesomely bad 80s movies. And there's a lot of awesomely bad 80s movies. And so we've kind of gone through all the awesomely bad ones. And now these four are kind of like the ones that are, I don't know, generally thought of as, as being pretty good. Awesomely uh, or, good. 
Yeah, I mean, like, um, they're all around 70% or higher on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, Princess Bride, ob- I think it's 97%, obviously much higher, but they're all, I mean, most of the ones we've talked about have been below 70%. Who the hell is that and... 3% who doesn't like it? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> What's a... wrong with them? Do it. Let's yeah. do a panel on them. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> call in. If you We're don't just... like Princess Bride, call in because yes, we, have some, in right we have some things to say. <laughs> It's it's funny actually. Well, I'll say I've only met one person that I can think of that didn't like Princess Bride, and he was a good friend of mine from graduate school who was from the UK. Did he have and one he was eyebrow? Big... Was he was he a weightlifter? <laughs> did he like no, no, gun... no. did he like guns a lot? No, no, no. He was like a he had no, no, six like fingers really... on his right hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a really cool. He's a really cool guy, and he, but he was a big fan fan of Red Dwarf. Oh, and so he was just watching Red Dwarf, and then. Because the reason he watched Princess Bride is because I had my DVD collection. And so, like, one time he just watched it because um, I was staying at his um, place for a while. So he's like, there's and... not enough cat jokes in this in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so he said, he's like, yeah, I watched that movie Princess Bride. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't think it was that good. And I was like, yeah, well, I don't think Red Dwarf's that good. So. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> and now that guy is dead. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, but, yeah, like, obviously... Um, <laughs> I forget what I was saying. Uh, no, yeah, like like um, these movies are generally remembered, you know, really fondly. Uh, it seems like, um, but um, yeah. So 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 we've. I feel like at this point we've pretty much watched every every fantasy movie from the eighties. That's kind of um, uh, you know like Hollywood movies, you know, that that people would sort of remember from their childhood. So that's why at the end of this episode we're going to kind of give our verdicts on on what we think the the best ones are because we've watched about thirty at this point um but yeah okay so with that little setup out of the way um why don't we start off with the never-ending story so um andrea yes say more about your feelings about never-ending story well i remember uh, i remember watching it as a kid and what i remember most about it is the song i loved that song oh great song yeah. yes yeah. um and and uh, I had completely forgotten about the song. So when I heard it again, I'm like, oh, what a great song. That's pretty much at this point the only thing I liked about it. What I do remember wanting to see it for is because the, the kid who pay, played Atreyu was the kid who played Boxy in the original Battlestar Galactica. Oh, right. Yeah. And, uh, and I had a huge crush on him. So um, So that's pretty much my main reason for watching it. Uh, I don't remember thinking it was a great movie. And watching it now as an adult, uh, I was completely 100% right. <laughs> um, the um, Let's see. The acting kind of st- stinks. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, yeah, not the, it's not a good movie. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with something good about it. I mean, you know, for the 80s, the effects were good. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that's about, yeah, that's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The one thing you will, everybody remembers from it is the horse dying. And that was very traumatic. Oh yeah. Ooh, that yeah. was, that I do remember being horrified by. They um, actually fade to black in the, yes, in the film. Exactly. The, you don't see them, the horse like go down by, under the mud. You don't see it, which yeah, I which guess th- is good. Thankfully. I, yeah. I, yeah uh, right, that, right, right up there with like Bambi's mother dying. It was kind mm. of just like. Come on, it's a kids movie. It's right. actually it's actually the best part of the movie, not in like a <laughs> yay, I like to see horses die, but no, I mean it's the most like I remembered it from having watched it 10 years ago as being a good movie because of that scene, because of this like sadness and he's got to try to fight through it and then there's this horrible like emotional moment. And then when I watched the movie, I was like, "Oh, that's the most powerful scene in the movie." And it is. And I I agree with that. Yeah. Um what I did discover about it um as I'm watching it is like this is some kind of like it's it's a it's a movie about depression. It's a movie yeah. about really depressed people, like a kid who's depressed because his mom died. Um, you know, the, the nothing being depression and overcoming you. The turtle that doesn't give a damn about anything and just wants right. to die. It's like the it, loss of dreams. Yes, I think. you know, the but loss it's of but it's but it's truly fantasy. like it's about depression. It's yeah. about yeah. depression the and great not nothing. letting. The great nothing, exactly. And anybody who's dealt with depression knows what that is. It's it is really like a great nothing. Yeah. Um, and you don't care if you die. Um, so I mean that discovering that about it was really interesting. Um yeah. just as an adult. 
you know. Okay, let, let me just, if anyone hasn't seen this movie, let me just sum up the, the plot. So there's this uh, kid, uh, Bastion, in, uh, you know, in, in modern times, and he's being bullied and he takes shelter in a, a like a used bookstore and gets his hands on this this magic book and he takes it up into the attic of his school and starts reading it. And the, the book, which is called The Neverending Story, describes this world, this fantasy world called Fantasia, where this this nothing, this sort of storm of chaos is kind of enveloping the whole world and destroying the whole world. And so the, the empress, uh, I guess initially her, the empress's uh, representative, calls for a hero who's this this 11 year old boy named Atreyu who like is from these sort of like plains people who ride horses and hunt with bows and arrows and stuff and he sets off to try to uh you know figure out how to save the save their world um and i can remember uh you know Andrew mentioned this this actor who plays Atreyu his name is Noah Hathaway I can remember as a kid thinking like he was so cool. I'm like, oh my god, this is the coolest 11 year old boy. <laughs> and actually, interesting note in that scene where the horse drowns, they had a this sort of me mechanical platform that raised and lowered, and he actually got caught in it. Like oh. the, apparently, the director Wolfgang Peterson, he wanted the actors to do all their own stunts. Apparently, oh. even if they're an 11 year old. Oh my god! And, and Noah Hathaway got caught on the platform and pulled underwater oh. and was Ooh, unconscious, oh my, oh my unconscious when they were able to get him. Oh, uh, holy oh, crap! Shit. <laughs> Yeah, that's right up there with uh, Vic. Vic, what's his Vic name? Morrow. Vic Morrow. It, yeah, well, in, uh, I mean, he didn't it, die. Thank God. No, you know, he, watch, watching yeah. that scene, and I'm looking. I'm like, I that horse is really underwater. Like, yeah. like they're really shooting this. That does. That's not a mechanical horse. Yeah, like, no. right. I, I really wondered how they shot that. Now, even the now. horses have to do their own stunts. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, so Spinantry said that the effects were pretty good for, yeah, for I mean, the eighties. Yeah. For the eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I always thought, so, um, Atreya, at one point he acquires this flying, this, it's called a dragon. It kind of looks like a cross between a dog and an old man. A luck, <laughs> dragon. Named a luck, a luck dragon. Yeah. A luck dragon with these pearlescent scales and these and cre creepy that, eyes. I always yeah. thought it, it, it looked kind of grotesque, to be honest. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought I as mean, a kid... It's, it looked, it's body, anyway, not his face. I thought as a kid it looked really cool. Um, I mean, watching it now, I'm like, okay, this looks way more like a big puppet than yeah. I yeah. remember. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where whenever you see a CGI you know, monster, you're like, oh, why don't they just use practical effects? Oh, there's a and reason. Then you yeah. watch, then you watch this and you're like, okay, I guess now yeah. I see why they don't use practical <laughs> effects. And why does it keep winking? That was like, it was like they could make it <laughs> wink because they had different controls on the eyelids. So they're like, we got to use that wink more. So they had it <laughs> wink like, that's like, we it, can't get very many facial expressions. So let's just have him wink. <laughs> let's just have him wink. But it was yeah. kind of creepy. It had this kind of like pedophile vibe to it. Whenever, whenever he would wow. wink at a tray, I'd be like, yeah. he would wink and he would, the time when he made him scratch behind his ear and he goes, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And, he, yeah. and he also yeah. does say, I really like children. So that was, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. The whole maybe, thing was, was creeping. Well, me there out. were a couple of creepy things like that. And then I, I, sorry, I just, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but I just, once I saw it, I couldn't take my eyes off it. The sphinxes had nipples yeah. on their breasts. No, I, I, I on noticed their that massive too. Breasts. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even if, if, if they're just the massive breasts, like I could have, you know, ignored it. It wouldn't have been no big deal. But it was the the nipples. Like, yeah, who they thought were that was a good idea? They were big. And then they used them twice, not yes! once, twice. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, I couldn't stop looking at it. It was like, I was, yeah. It was like yeah, some I, stiff breeze blowing through that end of the world. Huh? I, I, I just thought, like, yeah, you know, it's the 80s, you know, that, there's. <laughs> Big That's right. We just got through the, the era of of um, statue nipples. Farrah Fawcett made not wearing a bra under her t shirt under her yeah, t shirt. Like, so when when we watched Dragon Slayer, a line that really sticks out from one of the comments I read is they said like, "Oh, it was back in the eighties when even a Disney children's cartoon would have a topless and topless woman in it at some point." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I. I I definitely noticed that. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> it was kind of hard not hard not yeah, to notice. Yeah, really hard not to notice. <laughs> I was really in frame for a while. <laughs> well, rather than get like too focused on the on the nipples and the bad things about the movie, <laughs> I, before we like devolve into just ripping this you know thing apart, I did think that the the focus, like you brought up, Andrea, on depression. And the you know the way it starts out with this kid whose like mom has just died, and then Atreyu loses his horse, and and it deals with the nothing and all. I thought that was very powerful stuff. 
Yeah. Um, I thought it was a it was a really cool uh, a really cool a really cool overall story. It's just the way maybe the you know the way it was done was uh, the execution was just kind of uh, lend it lended itself lent itself to a lot of cheese. Yeah. I well, thought. let me say so. This is based on a novel by Michael Ende, and I haven't read it. But um, in one of the previous interviews I did, I remember a guest talking about how it was like his response to to Nazis and. Um, I forget he was, uh, you know, from some country in Europe where, where that had been occupied by the Nazis. Oh wow! And and it was, you know, like about how and in in apparently in the book it makes more of this idea that the people, I, I you know, when 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 the creatures, I, I forget. It's like if the creatures escape from Fantasia, they become lies in the real world, and too many lies, you know, results in you know like fascism or it was something it was something along those lines. I. Uh, hmm. I should have read up more on so that. So the great but nothing is creeping fascism, basically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think okay. so. And and Michael, I did read that Michael Enta, like was not happy at all with this movie and actually sued to try to get his name taken Ooh. off of it. Or, oh, wow. That's bad. So, so I don't know what they, um, I don't know, you know, but but I, I mean, I, I my, my impression anyway is that there is this like very serious, you know, thoughtful book, you know, behind this. So I think some of that is, if, even if they kind of butchered it in this, adaptation i think some of that is kind of peeking through in some scenes especially like the part where um there's this wolf and it kind of has this this monologue toward the end of the movie where where it talks about dreams and lies and things and that was one of the parts where you're like oh this is more philosophical than yeah you know than you would think it kind of felt hammed in there at the end i thought uh sorry sorry say that say that matt you you thought it was just kind of it just shoehorned in shoehorned in yeah just it just felt like yeah. They they could have set that up a little bit better earlier on that that these were the themes that we were playing with. Um Yeah, I mean it's The Neverending Story is one of those movies that I always wanted to love and I felt like it's something that I should love, but I always just felt disappointed by it. And yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with just kind of the climax. It's yep. just, oh, you just have to give her a name. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it seemed like, like, you know, as we said, there's this gr- this idea of this encompassing nothing. And it seems to be like tied to, you know, people are, are not really interested in, in fantasy and, and, you know, their, their dreams are dying. And this idea that like you can create a whole world through fiction and fantasy is is a powerful one and i like that and it just seems like oh you just give her a name and i i get it like that's you know giving something a name is giving giving life to a fantastical idea but it just i don't know for the effort that you know a tray you had to go through it just seems yeah. sort of anticlimactic and then we didn't talk about this does anyone else find the childlike empress like really creepy they they made her kind of a little sexy which like I, very a, creepy. Yeah, lip, they put, like, the lip all gloss. this makeup on yes. her, and like I feel like and, they replaced her voice too. I didn't check, but uh, she reminded me of the girl from uh, from Dune, Alia. You know, uh, oh, where yeah. she spoke in that um, dubbed over voice. Oh, yeah, that was creepy. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, well, I think like she's called in the credits the child's like empress so mm-hmm. i think she's not supposed to be a ch- she's supposed to be you know i, I think some ancient yeah. being who just looks like a child just looks like uh, a child yeah um but i always i always the that ending i always liked the, the that always really stuck out to me there's just this idea of the whole world kind of coming apart and just like the castle floating on the sort of rocky prominence in outer space and 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 this conversation where they're you know uh, so Atreyu has this conversation with the Empress where where she says you know like the boy reading the story he doesn't realize that this is all real and that he's the only one who can save us I, I don't know I find that that works no really I, well. that yeah. that I think is is very cool and and actually like I'm getting chills as I'm thinking about it because it's it it was just it was cool like this idea that Bastion the boy is is reading the book and then sees them mention him and not just like mention him but say oh and he ran from the bullies and hid in the bookstore yeah um and and that part i i was like oh that's that's awesome and and he you know as a kid he's like i remember when he's like this can't be real this can't be happening and i'm like but it is real i'm like (laughs) yeah i remember being so invested in that moment well you know what i think that's it, it it hit me in a way that 
like as a child, when you're reading fantasy books, and, and this certainly was me as a child reading fantasy books, I wanted to be a part of the story. I wanted to be, you know, mm-hmm. in Middle Earth. I wanted to be uh, in all those stories. So I think that's what it appeals to, uh, the yeah. idea of wanting to escape your own shitty life, you know, what you what you think is a shitty life as a child, um, or it could be an actual shitty life, and become a hero. Um, right. You know? Yeah, and, and I, I agree, and I think that the uh, it does involve you, the viewer, at the end too, because it says you know, and the people who are watching Bastion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yes. and I I agree that it was such a you know it was a cheesy movie, but it, but I I really thought the ending was really cool and felt inevitable, and um, I think it could have been improved a little bit though by by tweaking it in like into like a Brazil type ending where the Bastion ends up lobotomized at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know he's, about that. He's flying along on on the luck dragon at the end and cheering, and then it, the camera suddenly zooms back, and he's like in a chair drooling. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that would have been really good for children. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, <laughs> like at the beginning, you know, his father's like, you, you know, you need to remain grounded, and this to me, like, but the his climax, father could have lobotomized him. Well, the climax like hinged on him, like. Bastion's like, I have to remain grounded. Like that, that was, that's what he, he literally says that. And yeah. then, yeah. and then he's like, oh no, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to indulge my, like, why couldn't he just believe it? I don't know. Like, well, I think that that's the part that sort of bothered well, me. The, the, what bothered me about that whole thing is that whole, you have to remain grounded. You have to move on. I was like, that is like the worst parenting ever. That is yes. terrible parenting. Right. I was like, no, no wonder all, the, all, all my our whole generation is fucked up. Like that's <laughs> yeah. that was the advice. Your mom died, but you know what? Time to move on, kid. Time to where's move your, on. Where's your you math know, homework? You're getting a job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was uh, like, I get, what I, the hell is this? Right. I think it's also worth pointing out that this apparently this movie only covers the first half of the book, which is was part of Michael Enda's big problem with it because he felt like it didn't like. You know, the, the point of the book was completely left out. Yeah. And so the the second movie is apparently the second half of the book. And I did see that as a kid, but I, I remember not liking it at all. And it's like 7% or something I, on Rotten Tomatoes. So I didn't, I didn't even really know feel like until now. It. I didn't even know till now that there was a, a, a sequel. I had no idea. Now I have to It, it was now. on TV a lot. I, I did watch it a lot. And I think there were parts of it that I really liked. Um, Wasn't there like an evil witch or something in the second one? I... Yeah, the only, the only, th- literally, the only detail I remember is that, that at the beginning he has to jump off the high board at the pool, and he's like imagining in his imagination it's like this giant like waterfall chasm thing that's like a thousand feet high, okay. and I'm afraid of heights, so that always stuck <laughs> in my mind. Like I'm not jumping off that fucking thing. Um, yeah. And then at the end of the movie, he's like brave, and now he's able to do it. But I don't remember anything that happens in between those two. Is it the same mind. kid? No, it's a different actor. Oh, okay. Well, I think I mean, it's for, the same. Is he's all? I think he's also. I think he's also named Bastion. He's the same character, but it's a different actor right. playing him, like an older actor. Well, you know what? I, I mean, I feel like it could have been a much better movie if they if they had had better actors. Like the two boys were just mm. bad actors. Sorry, kids. I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Just... And and there were some like bizarre things that didn't make any sense within the story itself like uh you know to pass the first gate between the sphinxes you must be very confident or just run yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. or just run or just go really fast yeah, yeah. either either I, one of those i felt like that was one of the things where like in the book it's this like thoughtful thing about character or something and then the movie they're like now we gotta like jazz this up a little bit how about if you just like ran and jumped away from the lasers you know in the middle of it you know yeah. like and put a four giant breasts in it too <laughs> yeah yeah although actually the the shot where the second gate he comes to where there's it's like the sphinxes but they're blue and yeah it's like underneath the moon or something that was like there's like really good visuals in this the movie. visuals like, can, um, yeah that one and the um the giant sleeping turtle yeah, uh, yeah. which i thought amazing. was just a cool scene ever and i was like oh man i you know i'd forgotten about that the turtle kind of looked like et by the way. Yeah, it did. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But uh, I just thought I'm like, oh, that's that's really really cool. I love that fantastical aspect of it. I wanted more of that. Um, and I think that scene you're talking about with the the sphinxes and the and the sky that 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 was also like some of the '80s special effects. Like they'd probably be definitely dated today, but they certainly have that 
like stark, stunning visual uh, appeal that you don't really see in in a lot of like today's CG effects. Yeah, I'd, I'd be I I would think this would be a good candidate for a reboot. Yeah, frankly. I'm yeah, surprised. you're right because it's such a great story, and then yeah. if they just did it with like good acting and good sc- yeah. script writing, and and uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I think it would be. And fantastic. considering that every, that's all anybody's doing these days, um, uh, you know, and and this is for some people a very uh, a loved movie. Um, yeah. I'm really shocked nobody's thought. Of I, it I think I could be wrong about this, but I think in my research I read that there was a pretty serious attempt to try to do a remake, and ultimately, like the right situation was somehow uh, complicated enough mm. that they they kind of had to abandon it yeah that's i'm not 100 percent sure that might have been some other movie i was reading about but i think it was this one mm-hmm. i wouldn't be surprised um all right but let's uh let's move on to labyrinth because this is a very similar movie in a yes. lot of ways where you know you have this girl sarah and she's uh, you know in the real world and she resents having to babysit her baby brother and then she she's really into like goblin mythology yeah. and stuff like that and for for some reason, sort of like wishes, sort of I think jokingly that her brother would be taken away by the goblins, and then he is, and then she has to go into this kind of fantasy world labyrinth and uh, try to uh, rescue him from David Bowie, who's the the king of the goblins. Can I can I just say that three of the four movies are about fantasy books, like reading yes. fantasy, yep, and then going into the story that you're reading. Yep, that's cool. I noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Interesting. Well, so Matt, why don't you, what did you, what, what's your overall thought? What are your overall thoughts on Labyrinth? So Labyrinth is in my top five movies of all time. Um, so my early, my memory of watching it for the first time is my sister was babysitting me. She's seven years older. Um, I saw it on HBO, so I don't know what year this was. Um, I guess I probably was a little older than the target audience. Um, but we we watched it and i remember like not knowing anything about it going in and then there's that scene at the beginning where um she's like oh i i wish they would take you away from me and you see the goblins i don't know if they're in the mirror or where they're hiding and they all wake up yeah it like freaked me out as a kid <laughs> but like at that moment i was totally i was to uh, that's it like i was in like you had me and um yeah just just the 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 layers of imagination that just keep building and like i think all the acting in this is great um uh even the the yeah like the uh the puppeteers the muppeteers um and uh just just the the message uh of it at the end is like you know we're there if you need us we're you know we're here if you need to escape i mean um you know there was something so um, just, it just provoked my sense of wonder, just the labyrinth. There was like, anything could happen. You go this way and there's like horrible fire beings. And this way is that, you know, the bog of eternal stench. And this way there's just like doors that talk to you and just that anything could happen. You go up, down, left, right. And um, just, yeah, David Bowie is the villain. I mean, come on. Uh, that. I, I really can't find anything wrong with this movie. Um, I, I have a few ideas. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> but my my favorite, well, one of my favorite parts is is when she's like, it's near the beginning when uh, I think some of you saw me mention this <laughs> this week on Twitter. When she, <laughs> yes. like, when she sits down and the, the worm goes, hello. And she yeah. goes, did you say hello? No, I said hello, but that's close enough. <laughs> yeah. You're a worm. That's right. Come on in and have a cup of tea. Meet the missus. Like, I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Um, and, and like, all these optical illusions and, um, you know, uh, like, Sir, Sir Didymus and, and, and Ambrosius, who's really just her dog. Like, if, if you watch, because I've seen the movie a lot of times, and I've seen this in... in, in um, Time Bandits as well. If if you look in uh, Sarah, Sarah's the main character. If you look in her bedroom, uh, a lot of stuff that appears in her bedroom appears later in the movie. Like yeah. yes. the, M- the M.C. Escher, Escher stairs yeah. is the obvi- obvious one. I had that poster in my bedroom and I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> um, which obviously comes at the end, but then also like the, um, like on the, 
what was it? There was like a, a, a poster. Oh yeah. The, um, what did they call the machine in the tunnel? The cleaner, the, the thing cleaner. that went through the tunnel that with all the knives, yeah. like she had a music poster in her bedroom. It said the cleaners. It was huh. like a band. It was oh, a band. Cool. So it's like, you could watch it later and say, Oh, this was all her imagination. She was just playing yeah. this this game in her head to occupy herself while her parents were away yeah and and the books too were it was like wizard of oz and um yeah and alice in wonderland which is what this was it's a combination of those yeah two. alice in wonderland and then if you notice when the clock strikes 13 which is really midnight she's at the bottom of the stairs which was like the scene right before that was when they were walking through all those like you know, MC Escher stairs. So I was like, oh, so they're, they're basically playing with this idea. Like the whole thing was just her way of, of like, how do I spend time with myself? You know, this is, I think a, a Gen X and earlier thing. Cause I think hmm. young, younger generations don't really have that boredom. Like there could be a time, yeah. at least when I was growing up, it was like, there is nothing to do. There was nothing on TV. It was a, like, what do I do? I don't know. And then you just play in your imagination, or at least I did. So thank goodness we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> right. Thank goodness. So God forbid like, I should be left alone with myself. <laughs> I think I think this movie was trying to show that that's like that's a good thing and that's a healthy thing and that, and we need that sometimes to just have yeah. like imaginative play. Yeah. Um, huh? yeah. And anyway, I love the movie. I want to I want to ask Andrea because Tom said that you know there were some some women who introduced this movie to him and I, I used to you know um, for for years I I um, sort of taught at this um, summer writing workshop where most of the students were were women you know young women yeah and they like were in, they all loved Labyrinth and just talked about it all the time and like watched it every summer and I do feel like this is a movie that has like some particular appeal yeah. to women yeah I was just curious if you wanted to comment on that no I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it did not appeal to me. I think here's the thing. I think, sorry, Matt. Maybe. Um, um, I think it's because I was too old when it came out for me it to really appeal to me. It is definitely a children's movie, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm uh, I I didn't I wasn't into it then, and now watching as an adult, I'm also like really irritated about what a spoiled little girl she is. It just she is spoiled drove me but, up a wall yeah, i feel so like luke a, skywalker though <laughs> yes I feel, yes i it, he is yeah i feel like i mean i only watched it just this week but i feel like it's not necessarily children i, I feel like it's like a, a you know like a, a girl discovering sexuality <laughs> kind of movie but that's part of it wow. well yeah. it, it, it's it is a PG, it's it is definitely a, pg-13 it, it's just it is a classic coming of age tale. I mean, this, yeah. where this young woman refuses to accept responsibility for her life until she's forced to choose between her childhood dreams and a less than perfect reality. And then that happens when she's confronted by this menacing supernatural being manifested by a goblin king in the form of David Bowie's frightening codpiece. <laughs> yeah, that was a, I, I'm sorry. I, well, I mean, the, the only draw of this movie for me is is David Bowie. I mean, the, the first, you know, the music started playing at the beginning and David Bowie singing. And then just like, it was so emotional for me because I just love Bowie. Um, so that was the real emotional hook for me personally. But yeah, he's yeah. the best thing about this yes, movie by yeah. far, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is sexual, though. You're right. The, the yes, whole like yes. the whole scene with the ballroom dance yes. near the end. And but is it sexual, though? Because like the, I, I rewatched it a few years ago with friends and we all said that like, yeah, it's so, it's so sexual. But then I, I watched it again. And it's like, they're, they're just dancing and like, not only dancing, like she's got this giant dress on, like she's not on well, the floor. Like, and, and they're looking at each other seductively, but it's also, it's also a nightmare. It's also like, I don't know. Like I, I don't it, think it's sexual in a good way. I, I think, you know, no, no, I, 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 I think, I think she is, Toying with the idea of, you know, I'm feeling these things and this guy is trying to make me feel more of these things. And and there's some scenes, there's a couple of scenes where like she's hanging onto his leg and his, you know, like eight inch cod piece is right in her face. <laughs> and uh, I really like that cod piece. Though. Well, I mean, it's kind of like- We got boobs I, I, in Never Ending Story and now yeah, a cod piece. I feel like this movie, you could you could rename it like synthesizers and cod pieces almost. But- um, but but I, I do think – no, I do think there's a lot of sexual side to it. But I think there is – along with the choice between 
for her between do I hang on to my childhood dreams or do I do I take responsibility for this world, this reality that is at times unpleasant, um, that is that 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 I you know do I do I make that what there's that choice between the, between those two and then there's also the choice of do I cling on to my childhood dreams or do I accept this you know these new feelings that I'm feeling and uh, kind of move toward those and she kind of makes a third alternative choice where she says you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the I'm gonna stop saying things aren't fair and I'm gonna you know because she says that a number of times in the movie that's kind of like a theme for her personality and then. I'm going to stop saying things aren't fair. I'm going to start just owning my situation, yeah. but I'm still going to hang on to my childhood dreams when I need them. But I'm going to kind of not go fast with these, you know, emotions that I'm feeling toward the, you know, toward a David Bowie type of character toward a man and not rush into that and not be like, Oh yeah, I'm just going to, you know, like run into your arms. Um, I thought it was a cool, she kind of made up her own mind at the end. So I thought, I think it's a very powerful story in that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought the, the scene that Matt was talking about, the, the, the mask masquerade scene, that was my favorite part of the movie that, and I also really liked where the, the sort of weird woman with all the big pile of junk on her back is like piling stuff on Sarah's yeah. back. That's cool. And you start realizing she's going to turn into one of these, these people. Um, but I guess, I mean, that's interesting, Tom, when you talk about the character development, I'll have to think about that, because that was really my, my big problem with the movie is that Sarah, um, you know, wishes that she didn't have to take care of her brother. And then I felt like that didn't really play much of a role in the movie. And I would have expected at least, I would have expected there to be some character in this fantasy world who was an analog for her brother or an analog for her stepmother or something or like her to have some conversation with somebody about how she ended up here and what she did wrong or like about her feelings about, you know, about her brother, or like whatever. I, it just kind of felt like there was just, just a lot of like Muppets shooting guns at each other and stuff that like sort of felt disconnected from any um, mm. character development in the story. I could see your point there, but I, but I think the whole movie is about that is about her starting out, not wanting to deal with her brother and then, I mean, she spends the, she goes through the entire labyrinth going, no, I got to get my brother back. This is, it, as much as I didn't like dealing with him, she's fighting the entire movie to get that situation back that she doesn't like. Yeah. I mean, it, it you know, she definitely is uh, spoiled. Like she's a, she's a spoiled girl living her imagination. And and to me, like the the, the main metaphor of the film is about growing up and having to deal with certain, certain things. And, you know, at the end, it's like, OK, you can still be an adult and have responsibilities, but you can still also still have your fantasy when you want it. Um, but, you know, regarding like the sexuality and the darkness of it, I mean, if you if you look at the early fairy tales, like even Red Red Riding Hood, right? Red Riding Hood was was basically a, a metaphor of like, don't go into the woods alone because you might have evil men rape you. I mean, that's the, no, if you look at the original if you look at the original fairy tale. So I think like they were playing with a lot of these fairy tale myths. Like, yeah, there is real danger in, in the adult world. The adult world is scary men that want to take advantage of you and scary uh, creatures that might want to hurt you and people that you love or trust, like a friend, like Hoggle, like that might betray you. So like, these are real things that as an adult, you're going to have to deal with. So I think like, oftentimes presenting it to children in a fairy tale form allows them to um, absorb these lessons without actually terrifying them with reality. Like, and so I think it's like the, the story is her finally accepting, you know, I, I gotta be an adult, you know, I, I, I gotta, and, and like literally has to walk through a labyrinth to get there. That's very well said. I mean, one of the um, one of the things I read, like on Wikipedia, I forget, but basically like the screenwriter, I think there were a couple of drafts of the screenplay. And one of the screenwriters who had worked on it said he wasn't happy with the final product because he felt like, the, I forget, there was like, there were like two people who basically he felt had conflicting visions for what they wanted the movie to be. Did it? Well, Terry, Terry Jones. Jones. Terry, Terry Jones. Jones. Yeah. yeah. Monty Python. From Monty Python. Yeah. Yeah. It was Jim but Henson I... and, and Terry Jones were the screenwriters. 
Okay, but but this I forget who it was who Terry was Terry Jones which... was was unhappy, I believe, um, with the final product. I think I read that a long time ago. I didn't look it up before before this panel. Yeah, but I think the earlier draft had more character development for the David Bowie character and like more about the, his interactions with Sarah. And then like, I mean that that I mean Matt, what do you think? I mean, do you, you do you agree with me at all that there's like too much random Muppet Muppets running around and not enough development of that relationship between? Sarah and and Jareth the Goblin King. Um, I could see I could see that read on it. So the way I take it is, she already had a relationship with him because she's so familiar with that book. She she's read it a hundred times. She has it almost memorized word for word. And I almost feel like if we went into the backstory of of Jareth and her, I just feel like it would it would take away from all the other stuff that's going on. I don't really need to know. Like I have enough, like I, I get it. He's, he's the goblin King. He rules over this, this land and, you know, um, he wants her, he can't have her. So he'll take her, her, uh, her brother. Um, you know, um, that's all I needed. I mean, I think like most fairy tales, that's all you really need. You don't need like a long backstory on the origins. Like, you know, the Cimmerillion of, of Labyrinth. <laughs> I, I agree. And I think I think there is one line where if you cut this out, it would be a much lesser movie. But there is one line of character for David Bowie near the end where he says, look, you can have your dreams. I'm offering you. Look what I'm offering you. You know, I, I'll give you this. Uh, uh, and suddenly the song China Girl just popped in my head. <laughs> um, I'll give you television. Uh, he's saying, I'll, I'll, I'll give you your dreams and, and I'll, you know, I'll, you can have anything you want. And all you have to do is let me rule you. <laughs> and then I'll be your slave. And then I'll be your like, slave. Yeah, which, yeah, which is I, so, I, yeah. I couldn't figure I couldn't parse that. And I, I think what it just meant was like, you know, you give up your dreams, you give up, you you know, uh, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how to, your, how to read it. I, I thought that was like an MC Escher uh, come like on, t- basically. It was <laughs> like he was like using the the stair, the inverted stairs to like try to come onto her and just be like, look, I'll do anything. you. I mean, I think that's a typical guy thing, honestly, as much as I'm a guy. I think that's a typical guy thing to be like after a woman and be like promising everything. But at the bottom of it, the guy just really wants to be able to control her. Yeah. And and I think that's what he's doing there. And I think that gives such blinding insight into his character that I, like you, Matt, I didn't need more. It's just another puzzle to, to unwrap like the labyrinth, right? So he's saying these like self-contradictory things, you know, like, like the doors where one tells the truth and one lies and the, you know, she's drawing the arrows on the ground and they're turned around. It's like everything is turned around. Everything is twisted. Yeah, All right, we need to move on. Andrea, any final thoughts on Labyrinth before we move on? Uh, yeah, I was off put. The, the The Muppets were off putting to me personally. I, the, the, I love um, I love Sesame Street and I love Muppet Show, but something about all of these just kind of creep me out. So I'm with you on at least hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> the, these right. Muppets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So how about Lady Hawk? So so Andrea, uh, tell us more about why you like. I, you know, it's like, Lady a, Hawk so much. It, I think it just, I saw it when I was a teenager and it appealed to me in every way, you know, that the teenage me want, you know, it was everything in a, in a story that the teenage me wanted, like a, a handsome knight and a beautiful princess and, um, and a, 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 an evil sorcerer slash, you know, bishop, um, or whatever the hell he was, you know, yeah, I was also in Catholic school, so. You know, I, I got that whole thing. Um, so, uh, you know, and it was it was a great quest. It's, a, you know, how can you not love Rucker Hauer? Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is as beautiful as you can possibly imagine. Um, and uh, it, it was everything the young teenage me wanted in a story. Uh, yeah. And it also looked great. It looks fantastic. Let me explain that. I forgot to explain the plot. So, um, so yeah, so we're in a, a fantasy world. Or I guess we're no, I guess we're in history technically. Yeah. Uh, in Italy, you know, roughly middle ages. I think it's. Around then. I think they're in France. France, yeah, right? Yeah. France. But there's a there's Spanish names, there's French names, there's Italian names, and I think it was shot in Italy, which is why it probably looks Italian. 
Oh, I just thought I, the the city is Aquila, and I think I looked that up, and it was it's an Italian city. Oh. Um, I but think, the names are all well. His French. name was Gaston, yeah. Matthew Broderick. <laughs> and so the, I thought, and right. there was Etienne de Bar. Isabeau yeah. was French. Yeah. All right. At, at any rate, we're in Europe. Uh, in, in, <laughs> yes. You know, hundreds of years ago, and so there's this uh, this captain of the guard, uh, Navarre, and he fell in love with this woman, Isabeau, and there was this bishop who was jealous of them, and so he made a deal with the devil and cursed them. And the curse, the nature of the curse, is such that the guy turns into a wolf at night. And the woman turns into a hawk during the day. And so they are always together, eternally apart, as Matthew Broderick says. Oh, and Matthew Broderick's in here, too, as a uh, a thief uh, character. Um, and, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much the, the premise. I, and it's, just, it's such a beautiful I, I love that just that idea of the, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, the, the one character is, you know, human at night and the other characters human it was funny my, my girlfriend steph she when i explained the premise to her she's like oh that's kind of like us because i wake up at like 4 a.m <laughs> she goes to bed at 4 a.m so it's kind of like that's kind of what our our relationship that's is like funny. but um um but so how about um uh, tom thoughts on lady hawk yeah i i think it has so many good elements everything you've mentioned i mean the um that that's such a beautiful problem where you have Rutger Hauer's character is a wolf and he's only human by day but she's a hawk and she's only human by night it's kind of like you know they're in this fantasy landscape and you got Matthew McConaughey uh, Matthew McConaughey <laughs> uh, Matthew Broderick very doing, different movie very yes. different movie as much well. I love all night, all I love night, all night. <laughs> I keep getting older they just stay the same <laughs> uh yeah so um so yeah and it, Matthew Roderick has some great lines like, you know, I talk to God all the time. Truth is, he never mentioned you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. I I found Rutger Hauer a little his character a little bit arrogant. Um, you know, the part where he's like, Oh, please, he tells the priest, kill her. She'd want that. Yeah. And uh, and you're kinda like, Well, <laughs> just kill yeah, her. That was she have won't you, just, have live you discussed this me. with her? Yeah. Well, no, we haven't spoken <laughs> yeah. in years. She'll want that. I just assume she'd okay. want to die. She yeah. can't have me. She'd want to be dead, you know. Also, yeah. why don't they leave each other messages? Like you would think they would write a well, letter to You know, each other. that that part of yeah. it, Andrea, reminded me. I mean, the whole movie kind of reminds you. It's got this fantasy landscape. It's got Matthew Broderick being funny. <laughs> it's got the 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 people who can't the, who love each other who can never talk and are, are communicating by messages. It's kind of like this uh Ferris Bueller's Game of Thrones at the Lake House. <laughs> yeah. Um so that's kind of how it, it felt to me. And I thought it could have been a beautiful story. But I just thought it was lacking. Number one, it was overdone. It was too long, I felt, at mm-hmm. two hours. It is two yes. hours, yeah. It, everything yes. is kind of too ponderous. And then I felt like there was something missing. The characters are all kind of, you know, like you said, Rutger Hauer is, you know, he's brooding. Matthew Broderick is fun. Michelle Pfeiffer is beautiful. The old, you know, the bishop is menacing. The gruff, faithful old priest gives a lot of heart to the movie, and he's fun to watch. But they just seem to kind of, stumble around in this in this landscape like bouncing against each other and they never really seem to resonate with each other and i felt like what was missing was in the lord of like for example in the lord of the rings the ring stands on its own as a magical artifact but it also stands for the abuse of power and the lust for power and there's a i think there's a missed opportunity in lady hawk to show that these two people who are separated by this magical curse they could have been separated by something human as well that would have made it made them as characters resonate more to me like yeah, yeah. like if they had been um if they had been you know in, in love with each other but they couldn't get over each other's human faults maybe mm-hmm. in addition to the magical curse i think yes. it would have given the movie a lot more drive for me yeah yeah or if they just like couldn't communicate about their feelings to each other when yeah. they were both human and then that then the fantasy becomes a metaphor for that that now they really can't communicate with each other because now one of them's an animal at all times right? yeah but since that was missing it was just kind of it just felt kind of disembodied to me it was hard for me to get into that problem that they had as much even though it was a yeah. beautiful problem well because there's this whole sort of like Cyrano de Bergerac subplot with with Matthew Broderick yeah. like yeah you know saying like oh he loves you so much she loves you so much when they can't say it for themselves so yeah it seems like that well 
all the pieces were all there. That's true. I, I maybe I missed that. No, no, yeah, I'm agreeing yeah. with you. It didn't work, but I'm just saying like it could have. There was the pieces were there. They just weren't put together, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Well, yeah. So, I think you know if someone described this movie to me or someone made a really uh, awesome trailer of this, I would be like, <laughs> oh my god, that sounds amazing. But watching it, I was like, boy, does this drag. Yeah. Um, it's too long, and there's a lot of stuff that's not a lot happening. And I have to say the music was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so Richard Richard Donner has done some good good scripts. So I don't know why this one kind of flounders a little bit. So I, I totally agree with the idea that if they had some human failure between them, in addition to the this magical barrier, like if they were really angry at each other, and then you have, like you said, Matthew Broderick come in between and be this like Cyrano de Bergerac figure um, to like, you know, mediate their their anger and get them together. I think it would have it would have worked better. Um, Rutger Hauer is beautiful to look at. So so mm -hmm. so is Michelle Pfeiffer. But like they don't really say or or do all that much. And in right. fact, when they do, it's really kind of baffling. So like. You know, for example, Rutger Hauer, um, the priest is like, I found a way to break your curse. It's like, oh, you're drunk. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> wouldn't he at least like hear him out, hear him out, man. Like, like, you know, you've been, you've been suffering under this curse for, I don't know how many years. And then, uh, the, the evil bishop who I, I, I every time I look at him, I, I think greetings, Professor Falcon. You know? yeah. Yes. yes. Like, yeah. Was he the same actor? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. why it made me think of Try War number games of too. players zero. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my terrible British accent. But um, so he just kind of like stands there and gives an evil stare for like half. That's all he does for half the movie. Right. And yeah. he's such a good actor. Yes. He's such a good actor. So that even when he has like great lines, like it's kind of a throwaway line where like one of his servants come in and, and uh, I forgot the exact word he said, but he's like, he's like, I come to you or you wait for me. And it was just like a one line. And I was like, yes, like he's such a, he's such a badass. But then like at the climax of the film, yeah. he just sort of just stands, stands there, there and just yeah. gives there and watches everybody. And, um, you know, there was this whole subplot of, um, Rutger Hauer's sword, right? Navarre's sword mm -hmm. that he's like, I'm saving this last jewel. And then they pretend to lose this. Matthew Broderick pretends to lose the sword uh, as a way to motivate him to go to the castle and, and be there with Michelle Pfeiffer during this eclipse. Um, so then I thought, all right, well, the reveal of the sword later has got to be this really uh, impactful moment. It's just kind yeah. of like, yeah, he just slides it over, slides and then it over. Navarre sees it and goes, "Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of like like not like oh my god, my family heirloom that's been in my generation forever that I thought I lost is still around." Like I wanted to see like the camera zoom in on it and like a beam of a beam of like eclipse sunlight comes on the sword and, and the gems, and he like his eyes light up. Like yeah, it, there was just a lot of missed opportunities for for tension, for dramatic tension. And instead we have these really kind of long, slow scenes that aren't really doing much. Yeah, I kind right. of, with the sword, I kind of expected, because I, I had, like I said, I hadn't seen it in a long time. As I'm watching it, I, I kind of expected like he would be in this fight with the other guard captain and mm -hmm. his sword would break and then he'd be vulnerable. And then that's when Matthew Broderick would come in with the with his sword. Oh, but that never actually cool. happened. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. how it classically would have been done. Yeah, but, um, but you lo you loved it, Andrea. I do so, love this so movie, what? Yes. What uh, what did you what did you love about it? Well, I I here's the thing. I as I said, I saw it when I was a teenager. Very impressionable. Um, it was built for me. It is a medieval knight love story, uh, with evil. You know, with an evil sorcerer. So it just hit every single point I was looking for. So it's like it's one of those things where I saw it at an impressionable age, and it it resonated with me. Um, yes, it, there are issues with the story, with the, with the pacing. Um, I agree with all of that, but to me, you know, teenage me, it is a great movie. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, absolutely. You you yeah. you you got on board with it when you were a teenager, mm-hmm. and you and you've, you've you stayed over- with it. Yes, and, and you overlook the problems. I and and to be yeah. honest with you, I didn't see the problems when I was a, 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 a teenager. You don't see those problems. You just see the story, and the the you know the romance and the the magic and the the horses and the swords and um, yeah. But now as an adult, and also as an adult storyteller, yes, all of these story problems are absolutely legitimate. Um, I you know, and I also yeah. think that our our tolerance now for um, like long scenes, uh, like establishing yes. scenes that are slow. Like we don't have that. Like that's a good fast point. Pace. Yes. And I think there was a lot of room. Like I'm, I tried watching like um, movies from like the sixties and seventies oh, it's, sometimes. It's painful. And then it's like, Oh my God, it's so well, slow. Yes. It depends. Happening. It depends. Like you could never release once upon a time in the West today. You just could never do it. Yeah. And if you haven't seen that movie, it's incredibly long with lots of long, slow shots it's a spaghetti western by sergio leone i think yeah, if sergio i haven't got that wrong sergio and leone. leone and and it's but every shot is like a beautiful photograph so you don't right. mind letting it drag because you're like wow i can really immerse myself no, in this shot i i have a problem with it um i, I agree with matt 100 percent. we do not have a tolerance um anymore for long beautiful shots um, right. You know, and I, I will say this, pro- a good portion of the reason probably for this was the DP is Vittorio Storare, St- Storaro, who is one of the most um, famous DPs of all time. Uh, he, he was the DP on Apocalypse Now. So, you know, talk oh, about wow. long, uh, wow. beautiful shots. Um, so I, pr- I think they probably indulged him. So that yeah. might have had something to do with it. Yeah, you're right. Um, right. But... Uh, but yes, we do not. I can't tolerate them either. Um, I just watched uh, a movie called um, The Leopard, which is based on a, a classic Sicilian novel, um, and it was from the ni- it was like 1957, and it was painful. This is a movie that won <laughs> awards all over the place in 1957. What it and it's all just long, long single shots of people walking and people, do, and it was just like. I was, I was like clenching my fists. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Move the freaking story. That is how right. we are as, as, you know, our, our, our attention spans have been cut short at this mm-hmm. point. And, right, well, you know, sorry, Dave, go ahead. We, we need to, we need to, we need to move on yes, because, sorry. because you know, people's attention spans of, are short. Yes. Attention span. <laughs> Podcasters, podcast listeners will not stand for long, long <laughs> conversations. Um, but no, but we, we seriously, we do need to move on to Princess Bride. But I think that makes actually a pretty good segue because Princess Bride is like the only one of these movies and maybe the only one in one of the 30 movies we watch, which is paced like a modern movie. Yes. You know, which is, oh, yeah. Um, well, so it's a really it was, striking. It was an largely hour thanks and thir- to William hour Gibson. And a half. Yeah, Hour it's short. It's just thanks to William Gibson being not both. William Goldman. Gibson. Goldman. Oh, William oh. Goldman, not William Gibson. I was like, wait, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a whole yeah. different you, movie. You didn't, know, you didn't know he wrote that? That's just, <laughs> yeah. This is like cyberpunk. This is the first cyberpunk <laughs> movie. But no, um, it's thanks to William Goldman being both a, a fantastic novelist and a fantastic screenwriter, which is like if you were playing Dungeons and Dragons, it's like you know having the paladin magic user character. <laughs> it was like 35th level or something like just invincible yeah yeah um all right do i even dare try to summarize the plot of princess bride oh you can do it uh, i think you can summarize yeah. it okay, okay so 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 buttercup and westley are two well you forgot beautiful- the, the framing the framing <laughs> <laughs> you can do it but let us criticize you <laughs> five seconds in <laughs> okay so so uh in the in the in the um present day uh, Fred Savage is a little kid who's sick from school and his grandfather, Peter Falk, comes over to read him the story of the Princess Bride. And so that's the frame story. And then in that <laughs> story, you have Buttercup and Wesley, who are two young, like, beautiful young people in a kind of fantasy medieval world. And they're in love, but Wesley's poor. And so he goes off to seek his fortune across the seas. And Buttercup hears that he's uh, been killed by pirates. And then the prince orders her to marry him. And then... Uh, she gets kidnapped by these three uh, sort of colorful characters. And it turns out that this this is all part of a plot by her husband, the prince, to start a war, to have her murdered and and to start a war with uh, that he wants to start with their neighboring country. 
Uh, and there's a lot more to it, but that's, I don't know. How's that? Anything else I should add there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's about it. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. So, um, and, and it just, I, I, I think it just goes without saying that this movie is amazing. As we said, uh, it's 10 times better than any other movie yeah. with the possible exception of the last unicorn, which it's maybe only five mm. times better than that. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I guess, um, I'm just curious. I mean, it's, I think everyone here said they've seen it many, many times. So I guess just what I want to start off with is just watching it, rewatching it this week. Uh, was there anything that sort of struck you that you didn't expect um, or that you didn't remember or anything like that? Uh, so, so Matt, anything surprising rewatching this now? Um, it's been a few years since I've last seen it, maybe, maybe as many as 10. And so just some of the jokes I had forgotten, mm-hmm. like, what about the RUS? rodents of unusual size yeah. i don't think they exist and then he gets immediately attacked by one like i just burst out laughing with that because uh i had forgotten and um i remember the very first time i saw it i really found uh wallace sean's character like like really annoying like inconceivable you know that guy. Oh. um but but I love him re- yeah. no but but re-watching it now I love him. So I think it was just like at a certain age, I was like, oh, he's so annoying. <laughs> but um, the weird thing is like, I randomly run into that guy. Like I've seen, <laughs> I've run into that guy like three times in my life. Oh, I hope in- you <laughs> shouted inconceivable at him. I know. They lo- actors that. love that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they, I'm sure he'd love it. So once was when uh, my cousin was born. He just was like walking behind us. Wow. Uh, as we were walking to the hospital and then, um, my father's like, oh, that's Wallace Shawn. And then and then uh, my mother sidles up to me and like, wait, who is that? I'm like, Wallace Shawn. She goes, who's Wallace Shawn? Oh, like, really? man. <laughs> that's my mom for you. Uh, she wants pissed off uh, Clint Eastwood. So um, it's another story. Good for her. Um, yeah, not intentionally. Um, and then uh, another time was that I was at a, um, there's a uh, a Yiddish theater on the, on the, um, on the at Battery Park, Manhattan. Mm-hmm. So I saw, I think I saw Fiddler on the Roof, and he was there. Um, he just came out. He looked exactly the same. This was like two years ago. He did not age. He looks exactly the same. I guess that helps if you go bald young. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah no, he looked good. I was like, holy cow. Um, and then there was one other time that I'm blanking. It might have actually been at the same theater, uh, but it was just anyway. So, but yeah. That's so, cool. so, so, uh, yeah. I mean, Princess Bride is one of those movies that you can just revisit again and again. And it's always enjoyable. Like there, there's just so many like great setups. And, and like, like you said, I mean, I was going to say this too, but I, uh, what you already said it, Dave, is just like the pacing of it, the plotting, it just, it just keeps moving. And um, there's never a point in this, like, Oh, when's the, you know, when do we get into the, the good part? It's always, this keeps you, keeps you going. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just a really enjoyable, fun movie, and and I think that it it knows its tropes, like it knows its fantasy tropes, and it plays around with them, but not in like a punching down way, like in a in a sort of loving way, you know, loving way, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about Tom? Did anything surprise you on rewatching this? Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, the first is the one one thing that really struck me was that the the cast shots at the end where they where they run through that it just really slapped me in the face that you could not ask for a better mm. cast yes. every single one of these people is awesome yeah i yeah. agree i mean 100 percent. manny patankin wallace sean peter falk mm-hmm. uh, for gosh sakes he's astounding fred savage robin penn christopher guest carrie elways um they're, they're all and i i'm sorry to leave out the you know the prince and the other actors but but they're but they're all they're all just astounding astounding actors i i can't even imagine like how good the casting director must have felt when <laughs> when when he or she i don't know who it was but when he or she realized like wow i this is the cast i put together it's it's just amazing yeah um now how many how many of them were were like really big and famous at the time, right? Well, Christopher Guest was, because yeah. he was, uh, you know, he was from uh, Spinal Tap. Yeah. Uh, he was, and he was from did, Saturday Night Live. Did you know that he's an actual British Lord? I did not know oh, that. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> I'm not, I, did, I didn't know this until I just 
I didn't even remember it. I didn't realize it was um, Christopher Guest, but wait, where's his title? He's the fifth Baron, ha uh, yeah, the, the fifth Baron Hodden Guest of Great Sailing in the County of Essex. And he was in the House of Lords until they uh, like made it, you know, they kicked out the, the Lords from the House of Lords, but yeah. <laughs> wow, no I didn't, never knew a, that. No wonder he's a comedian. Imagine having that as your title. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Amazing. But no, I had no clue, but... um. But just all of them. And then the other thing uh, that struck me was I was just just I mean, Dave, Dave Barry has this uh, has this old I don't know if you guys remember. Oh, of course you do, because you're older, too. But um, Dave, <laughs> Dave, except for you, maybe Dave. But Dave Barry, well, I remember I'm old enough certainly to remember Dave Barry. Yeah. OK, sorry. So he was a, if you're if you're younger than me, he was a, yeah. a, a famous newspaper humor columnist. Yeah. That's right. So he had this great column uh, about brain sludge, about things that just get lodged in your brain and they come up over and over again and they mm. can be from anywhere. It could be from some random commercial, but every time you're in a certain situation, like where somebody says, uh, well, that's not fair. You know, the, the, the line from Labyrinth pops into your head or something. So um, so I, I get this. I think the Princess Bride a accounts for like, 45 percent of my brain sludge like yeah. so many of those lines just yeah. pop into my head at random times during it's the mostly day. dead yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly because so long have fun storming in the, the castle. castle yeah i mean yeah. anytime i say goodbye to somebody that pops into my head <laughs> yep, and exactly. i actually say it quite a bit i'll say so long have fun storming the castle yeah like oh yeah princess bride yeah <laughs> but um <laughs> But no, so to the point where just a couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm on this text thread with three of my high school friends um, where we message each other all the time, like multiple times every single day. And just a couple of weeks ago, I ran across this great meme that I had seen before where it's somebody has taken one of those uh, stickers from that you put on when you're in a conference or something. And it says, hello, in like all capitals. And then it says, my name is, and then there's a blank. And somebody had written, Inigo Montoya, you killed my father. For <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I screenshotted it and I posted it to that thread and they and it like launched this lively discussion where they're like, that's awesome. And they were like, that's so funny. And they started talking about other Princess Bride quotes. Um, so yeah, it's just such a, it, it occupies so much of my mental real estate, this movie, mm -hmm. from the first time I saw it when I was in, I think I was in college. I think I was a young college student. Um, it's just such a fantastic movie. And then, um, just the fact that this, this, the guy who wrote it, uh, William Goldman, he wrote, you know, he wrote the marathon man book and movie script. He wrote the princess bride book and movie script. He wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid book and movie script. And I don't know, I don't know what else, but, um, but that alone, I mean, you know, the Sundance Film Festival, <laughs> you know, Oscar winning movies, the marathon. If you haven't seen Marathon Man, oh, my gosh, what a great movie. Although, you know, you got to it's, it's the slow 70s thing going. But yeah, it's, it's still it's still a thriller. It's still a thrilling movie to watch. It's very it's very yeah. thrilling and very well written. And yeah. and I've I went after I saw The Princess Bride. The reason I know this is because I went and read the book and then and, and was and was blown away when I found out he wrote the movie script, too by how good of a job he did on his own movie, which, you know, on yes. his own book, adapting it, which, you know, if you've, if you've, you know, looked into other authors who've done that is not an easy no. thing. Like look at a uh, maximum overdrive by Stephen King. Whoo, what a, yeah. well, as Stephen King would say, phew, who farted, right? <laughs> uh, Andrea, uh, anything surprise you rewatching this? Um, it, I, I agree with Tom that it just takes up a lot of my, brain space with the lines I, I there's so many lines in here that i still quote um and just use randomly and and uh one of them in particular i remember th that i always say which is i don't think that word means what you think it means yeah and, and recently i was you know i was thinking i was saying that and i was like what movie is that from i couldn't remember it and then it was i'm watching it this morning and i'm like oh it's this movie um but yeah, I just quote so many lines from this movie. It is such a, a, a foundational part of how I relate to the world. Um, and it really struck me as I was watching it this morning, how hard the jokes hit, how they, how hard they still hit. I knew they were coming, you know, and I still laughed like that, that the, the church scene where they push in on the bishop 
and you're pushing it and you know what's coming the whole mowage and and i know it's coming and i'm watching and he says it and i still burst out laughing yeah i mean that is that is the 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 um it, the pinnacle of a great joke is it will always make you laugh no matter yeah. how many times you've seen it no matter if you know it's coming if it That's makes right. you laugh out loud that is a great joke it is absolutely hilarious um you know and and not even just like funny lines it's chock full of funny lines but it's also chock full of um real real lines like real emotional lines there's this one the line where wesley says she says you're mocking she uh, buttercup says you're mocking my pain and he goes life is pain anyone yeah. who says anyone who says differently is selling something it's selling it's something it's, yeah, it's like, i was like i was like wow that was yeah a great it's, line. it's one it's funny but it's yeah. also so real you know yeah. and especially as an adult you're like yep <laughs> yeah i yeah. i have to say andrea i did not understand that line when i was like 19 yes. at all and now watching it the other day i was like i finally understand Just that e- line exactly yes. exactly yeah um, well, well let me yeah. let me ask you about that because i you know like i said i have this whole movie memorized and i wasn't expecting to really have any issues with it um but rewatching the scene where where so so what's happened is um wesley has come back in the guise of the Dread Pirate Roberts and has rescued Buttercup from these kidnappers. And uh, he's really mean to her. Um, And he's really upset with her for not waiting for him and getting engaged to this prince, even though we're told that she had no choice. Um, And there's even one part where, you know, he like raises his fist like he's going to smack her. And I was kind of like, whoa, I, uh, this is not, this is not okay. Um, And, um, yeah, I, I was, and it, it also like even just in plot terms, it didn't really make sense because I don't understand why he's just not like. Oh, it makes total hey, sense it's... in plot terms. Okay, well, so explain it to me, Tom. Because he he doesn't he de- from his point of view he doesn't know if you know what's going on if if she's been kidnapped by the prince or she's being she's being forced to marry him against her will or if she's really loves him or something, and so rather than show up as wesley and confuse her he shows up as this you know alter ego who's kind of a jerk to kind of rile her up and see if he can get her to reveal the truth um without without i guess this is pretty bad without having to have a real conversation with her but he just wants to quickly like learn like what's going on so he figures if he just stays in character as a dread pirate roberts and says oh this is what you are and then she'll she'll either be like well, look, you know, I, I love this print or she'll be like, no, you don't understand me at all. And just lay it out to a stranger. And then he's like, okay, now I, now I know what's going on. I mean, I don't necessarily think, I mean, like Wesley is like the hero for her. Right. But in terms of like a moral character, he's absolutely not. I mean, he basically spent the last whatever number of years being well, a pirate. True. That's it's clearly true. like, yeah killing people and stealing their their gold you know like so you know that's who he is and then he's like yeah i'm gonna give pass the pirate torch on to the (laughs) the next guy and you know you can you can murder and kill and steal and i'm gonna (laughs) settle down with my my girl (laughs) i mean you know it's silly it's ridiculous but i mean i i think like i we were saying before it's it's aware of like the fairy tale tropes like you know (laughs) this is like a lot of these stories this is another thing because like the, the the million other times I watched this movie, the way I always imagined it in my head was that Wes that was that the Dread Pirate Roberts had such a fearsome reputation that Wesley would just sail up to people and they would just like give him all their gold because they're so afraid of him. But he never leaves people um, alive. But and well, right. But but he says, you know, like nobody would surrender to the Dread Pirate Wesley. I had to be the Dread Pirate Roberts. But it's like, well, but if the Dread Pirate Roberts kills everybody every time. Nobody would surrender to the Dread Pirate Roberts either, right? Because you would fight to the death every time because you would have no choice. So it, I don't know. It seems like – so are we, are we meant to understand that Wesley has just, like, killed, like, hundreds of people over the last five years? And, I, but I, he or hasn't or are the, we meant to understand – oh, go ahead. But he hasn't been the Dread Pirate Roberts for five years. He, okay, he well, was for the last – Whatever, yeah. Two years or whatever. Yeah. But I, I think uh, you need to take uh, some advice from your excellent short story, Dave, The Black Bird, and, and there's a point at which you need to stop digging at the surface because everything just starts to bleed. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a solid gold movie. But, yeah, I think 
I think if you dig too hard at, at certain parts of it like that, it's like, like Matt says, you just have to say, well, this is a fairy tale trope. And this part of it, we're not supposed to literally be like, yeah, he's a, he's this mass murderer. Well, here's the thing. When I was watching the beginning, um, where she's mean to him and all he keeps saying is, is, uh, as you, as you, as wish, you wish, yeah. I was like, wow, that's, she's an awful person. And I wrote in my notes, portrait in an abusive relationship. <laughs> she's like, she's just mean as fuck. And then he just, he just, you know, all he says is as you wish. And I'm like, wow, she's terrible. Well, well, this is, yeah, maybe like, yeah, my, like Tom's right. I'm just think, overthinking this, but it's just like, I couldn't help, you know, watching it this time. I'm like, yeah, this is the like one true, like the once in a generation love story is the like guy who's like, don't talk back, like, don't talk back to me, you know? Um, I don't know. It just seemed. I don't think he's ever going to say, don't talk back to me once the mask is off. I think he was playing a character for her in that, but, in that scene just but, to get the information. But I agree with you, Dave. The, the raising of the fist was disturbing for me. I had forgotten that. Like, even if he's playing a character, it's like, was there not any other way yeah. to yeah. go about this? No, that's a good point. And there's other parts of the movie, too, that have always kind of irked me a little bit. Like, near the end, after he takes the miracle pill... He's kind of he's kind of a jerk to uh, Andre the Giant's character. Who another? I forgot to mention that. What another great great casting choice. But um, but he's kind of a jerk to him when he's like, he's like, oh, you think we have this, this, and this going on? You think a little head jiggle is supposed to make me happy? Hmm? And Andre the Giant's just like this friendly guy, like smiling at him, and he's he's just sort of a, a acidic toward him. And uh, yeah, there's little things like that 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 kind of irritate me about the movie but but they're so minor compared to how great the movie is that it, it they never really bother me i mean I, I i kind of like that he's a little scoundrel-esque i mean i i obviously i don't like that he raised his hand towards her but i feel like you know the character he's playing he's he's you know definitely a morally ambiguous figure yeah and the, and the bodice ripper uh you know, genre of fiction of that, you know, swashbuckling era, as right. much as it's not in favor today, I think that is, that was the trope that he was kind of going with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they said they wanted him to look like Zorro. That's like, he did. Costumes. Yeah, he does. Yeah. And yes. Zorro was very, uh, you know, that way, sort of morally ambiguous and rough. Uh, I guess I'll just say the other, the only, really the only other issue I have with the movie and this is, I've had this since I was a kid, but um, there's a part where um, Inigo says, um, I'll just read the quote. He says, he bested you with strength, your greatness. He bested me with steel. He must have outthought the Zini and a man who can do that can plan my castle onslaught any day. And this has just always struck me as maybe too much of a stretch, too much of like <laughs> an intuitive leap to that. Um, I think like if, if Fezzik just said, oh yeah, he bested Fizzini in a battle of wits or something, that's how Fizzini died uh then maybe it, it, i don't know it just it seems like a little it's always seemed a little bit too much to me like okay we got to get on to the next plot point we're just going to kind of like uh you know just quickly what's the word just you know sort of like brush past this this you know how how inigo hand, hand wave it or whatever yeah like yeah like yeah. like inigo like gets this idea into his head that that he needs wesley to plan this castle thing and and, I... and the, the sort of chain of logic is a little little bit of a stretch well there. i mean it's a fairy tale you can you know um yeah. st stretches of logic are are par for the course and you know it's a fairy tale it's is it a children's movie it's sort of it's the one of those movies that's you know straddles the the line between children's movies about, and adult movies it's about fred savage yes <laughs> discovering his sexuality <laughs> <laughs> where were the boobs that's what i want to know <laughs> yeah um, what the heck no boobs <laughs> well, they they did say it, they were off they were off stage because uh, where there's that one line where, where yeah. Wesley says, "You know, there oh, yes. were some perfect breasts in this movie. You just never." Yes, that's, yeah. you're right. You're right. There's only a few pairs of perfect breasts in the world. It'd be a shame <laughs> to ruin yours. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I I I think I do think Dave, you you might be overthinking it on this. Uh, I in agree. This particular. I agree. Situation. All right, cool. I mean, no, but it, I mean, it's like, you know, for a long time, probably still one of my like five top favorite oh, God, movies. Yeah. I mean, I, I love it, yeah. um, but I don't know. Nobody has any 
Am I the only one who has any criticisms whatsoever of this movie? The, those, I mean, you hit the, the the raising of the fist, and and my, you know, my first thought when I was watching at the beginning, which is she's awful to him. Why would he? Why would he be attracted to her? But you know, yeah, abusive I, I relationships he, are that way. <laughs> I think he sees through the the way she's acting to like that she's trying to act tough, but she's he can tell what what she's feeling, and then he he just reacts to that. Mm -hmm. But I also I also think. Dave, in answer to your question, there are certain things about this movie that I've always thought, yeah, that's kind of a problem, but I just don't care. Because like Andrea with Lady Hawk, I just got on board the thing and never got off, and I, and I probably never will get off. I, I just think it's, a, it's just a fantastic, wonderfully made movie. So if, especially if you read the book and you see the parts he cut out and you see what he transitioned from narrative into dialogue and action – it's astounding the job he did. It's, it should almost be taught in film schools. Like people should have to read the book and then watch this movie and, you know, have the screen, look at the screenplay and just be like, oh, so that's how that's done. So just there's a, a podcast called Script Notes. Uh, it's Craig Mazin and um, John August. They're both really, um, really talented script screenwriters and they do a podcast called uh, – script notes and and occasionally they will break down classic screen screenplays and they do an episode on princess bride and it is so worth it to go listen to them talk about it cool um, yeah yeah Sounds, I, would, I would i guess just hunt that down i guess I just you know this is another small thing but um like i just watched this this morning with the subtitles on and i never realized how much i didn't understand what andre the giant was saying before <laughs> yeah it's hard like 50 50 of his lines i read the subtitles I was like oh is that what he was saying i i i watched this like 30 times and like never understood what he was saying at that part <laughs> yeah well he what is he he's german or austrian isn't he um i think he's like some kind of eastern or european belgian maybe but but i i think he um yeah it was hard for me the first you know 20 times I saw the movie to understand it, but I've, I've got it all now, I think. <laughs> I just turn the volume up whenever you talk. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, cool. So why don't we uh, get into our top five 80s fantasy movies? So I, um, so obviously, it, I'm going to assume everyone thinks Princess Bride is number one. Does anyone, anyone disagree with uh, that? He, it's not on my number one, but it's... It's on my list. Five. It's not? Yeah. It's no, not it's my not. number one either. Am I oh, disinvited wow. from all future podcasts now? Okay, I'm, oh, I'm sh I, I thought I, I thought there was going to be consensus I, on that. All I right, wasn't so. ranking; I was just picking them out. I don't want to rank. It's hard to rank. It really is. It is, but I did it anyway. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't want to play favorites. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, how about I'll just give you my my top five, and we can go from there. So I have Princess Bride definitely number one, Last Unicorn definitely number two. And then, um, you know, it's a significant step down in quality, in my opinion. But number three, I have Willow. And then it's another significant step down in quality for me is number four, I have Never Ending Story. And then number five is sort of um, is sort of a toss up for me between Conan the Barbarian, Highlander and Dark Crystal. Mm. And I have been it's been a while since I've watched. I mean, not years, but it's been at least a year or so since I've watched any of those. So I'd have to go back and rewatch to say which of those I think deserves the number five spot. But that's sort of where I'm at. Um, so, so, so Tom, you said you have an actual ranking. So, what's your actual ranking? Well, first, I'm astounded that Never Ending Story is on your list because yeah. I thought, from what you said today, I would have thought it would be way down the bottom somewhere. Uh, well, there's there's like 30 movies that uh, I would rank below Never Ending. It, it's more wow. like wow. Uh, well, why, yeah, so, why is but, it so high just because the other movies are so bad in your, yeah. in your opinion? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so anyway, so, so I have as number one and I apologize in advance. I'm not going to have the last unicorn on my list at all. So I'll just get that, <laughs> get that out of the way right away. I loved the movie. I thought it was great, but I just had others that I liked more. So number one was, uh, was time bandits. Um, mm, I had that on my list. Cool. Yeah, I, I just absolutely love that movie. And then mm -hmm. uh, Princess Bride is number two. Labyrinth is number three. Highlander is number four. And Conan the Barbarian is number five for me. Okay. Our lists are similar. Cool. Okay. So Matt, what's, so what's your list? All right. So I want to just preface this by saying that this is not definitive for me. And like, were you to give us 10, I could probably come up with more. Let me just ask a question really quick. Do you consider Flash Gordon fantasy? No, right? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's too bad. 
<laughs> He's I crossing mean, we, we something talked, off right now. What about what about Beetlejuice? We never really talked about that in the show. Was it eighties? No, is... Wasn't it eighty eight? Yeah, I think it's eighties. Yeah, but this is this is more more like like high fantasy. Okay, high fantasy. Sorcery. Gotcha. Uh, okay, okay. All right. So this is my list. Number one is Labyrinth. That's that's my all time favorite fantasy movie. I think. Okay. Uh, no, number two is Time Bandits. Uh, number three is Princess Bride. Uh, number four is Highlander, and number five. I know you guys are gonna uh, disagree with me on this. Is Crawl? I love I love the movie wow. Crawl. I know it's I know it's really cheesy and and corny at parts, but there's something about the the world of that film that uh, draws me in every time. You know, it's one of those things like like Andrea, like you said with yeah. with Lady Hawk, like. I, I watched that movie yeah. with with my cousin who's no longer alive, and I have an emotional attachment to it. Yeah. And it just every time I watch it, I'm I'm like back as a kid in that oh, theater yeah. watching yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, what's your list? okay? I don't, I didn't rank them, um, so I'm okay, just going to list off uh, my favorites. And also, I think I come at this as as a uh, from a filmmaker point of view. So it's like, is it a good movie as well? Um, mm. So, uh, yes, Princess Bride, um, Conan the Barbarian, um, Highlander, Last Unicorn, uh, Sentimental Favorite, Secret of Nim. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that's a great that, movie. Yeah, that might be, that might be it. The most of the rest of these movies are kind of sucky. <laughs> I mean, I actually would give honorable mention to Heavy Metal just for introducing yeah. my young self to a Heavy Metal. You know what? I'll yeah. go. I'll go with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and Excalibur, I think, is is a. I after rewatching it for this podcast, I, I remember liking it a lot more now than I did when I first saw it. Yeah, really? yeah. I'll go I with just, that too. I yeah. I can't get over Excalibur being a bad movie. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's visually that's, gorgeous. That's it's, fine. That's fair. Yeah, it's yeah, visually it beautiful, this. but. But There's so a lot of else, cheese there. Nobody else had Willow on their list. At no, all, right? I, I no, actually disliked no, that. No, movie. I was no. my jaw dropped when you said Willow. Actually, yeah, I, me too. <laughs> How come we never watched Clash of the Titans? Oh, oh yeah, uh, was that eight? That was 80s, that was right? definitely eighties, yeah. straight up eighties. The heck, Dave? Not, not really sword and sorcery or epic what? fantasy. What? Uh, what? There's swords. There's sorcery. What? Because it's mythology. That doesn't count because it's mythology. Because it's not. I mean, some of these are not secondary worlds. Yeah. How does, yeah, how does Lady Hawk uh, work then? Or, or even Time Bandit. Well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's got to have a long. That's. It's got to have a long sword or a goblin. It does. Oh, it's it has a bastard sword. sword. No, it's a bastard sword. It's not a long sword. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> well, being a D and D geek. You are really splitting hairs, frankly. <laughs> uh, all right. Well. So so Matt, so Clash of the Titans would be in your top five if if it, if we had watched it. It would it would be a close runner up. I mean that's yeah. another movie that if that's on I'm I'm watching it. Me too. Seen yeah, me too. In years. It's not a good movie, but it it does also. It's one of those I watched it when I was a kid. I loved it when I was a kid. So what's the main? What's the lead actor's name in it? Harry oh, Hamlin. Uh, Harry Hamlin. Yeah. He I, I just think he's great in it. Yeah, and certainly better than that remake they made a couple of years ago. I don't. I, I, I skipped it. it. Oh God, it was terrible. <laughs> I skipped I hate, it. Yeah. I can't stand Sam Worthington though. I think he's possibly one of the most boring. Sorry, Sam. Oh <laughs> wait a minute, is Sam Worthington the guy who's in uh, Galaxy Quest? He plays Guy. No, 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 no. He's, he's in like Avatar. Character in a Avatar. Yeah. James Cameron. It's Avatar. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, uh, I like him, but. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's see. So from what I remember, so it sounds like Time Bandits people rated a lot higher than I would have thought. So maybe I should. That was like, I guess a lot of this is like, you know, I grew up watching Willow and The Last Unicorn and The Neverending Story, and I had never seen Time Bandits or maybe something else people mentioned until recently. That's so. totally valid. You can't. You can't. Once you, you're, you're kind of like. Uh, imprinted like a bird you know if they if they're if they're around a human yeah. when they hatch out then they think yeah. they're human and that and that you know when you're when you're forming your young self and you watch these movies they just 
get into a part of your psyche that closes when you're older. So mm -hmm. I, to I totally get it. You know what? I forgot to mention Beastmaster. Terrible movie, yeah. but it's so bad. It's fantastic. But I'll watch that anytime. Anytime. I, I will too. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's... it's just hard. I mean, like, I don't think Willow's a great movie, but it just seems self-evident to me that it's better than Crawl or Beastmaster or, or something like that. Oh, like, yeah. It's just so... Yeah, but Beastmaster yeah. is so much fun. Um, I don't know. I, I don't it's... find Willow a lot of fun. I get I get irritated by a lot of it, <laughs> frankly. Well, what's his name is is fun. Um, that was... Del Kilmer. Del oh, Kilmer yeah. is very yeah, he's... That's That's the best yeah. part of it. Yeah. Um, I think on an earlier episode, Andrew, you said that you thought that Conan Bar you, you described Conan the Barbarian as a legitimately yeah. I forget if you said legitimately good or legitimately I, I it was in an movie. email. I sent you an email. Yes, no, I okay. think it's a legitimately good movie. It's it's not a, a, a I'm sorry, and also Highlander. I definitely said in, in oh Highlander movies, yeah Highlander oh, is wow. a genuinely good movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that it's uh, it's almost. I think I said it was kind of like almost. Um, uh what's his name um psycho what's his the alfred hitchcock alfred it's it's almost hitchcockian in its opening uh sequence um yeah no i think oh, highland stadium yeah yes the stadium mm -hmm. um I, I highlander and conan the barbarian are two genuinely good movies like that opening sequence in in conan the barbarian is f amazing it's yeah. still amazing with the the combination of the amazing music, the visuals, um, you know. And it's uh, got Arnie. It's got well, he's not in the beginning. <laughs> Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger is. Yeah, in the sorry. Beginning. What's remind me? What's the opening sequence? When he's a boy Conan and he's talking to his father, and the father tells him the secret of steel, and then they go to the attack by um, uh, what's his name? The bad guy. Who's the bad guy? It's been a while. I can't think of it. Yeah, uh, he does. Oh, oh, it's uh, Edward James. Or, no, um, no. Uh, um, oh God, what's yeah? Uh, he does. He does Darth Vader's voice. What's his name? Oh, James Earl Jones. James, James Earl, Jones, Earl Jones. Yes. Um, and, and he, you know, and he comes and then he cuts his mother's head off, and it's it's this amazingly exciting attack scene with the dogs, and then you know we get the him killing his mother, uh, and right there it sets up the entire movie. Um, it's a mm -hmm. genuinely good movie. I gotta watch I it will, again. I, I haven't seen yeah. it in a while. I will. I will say, like, because we discussed it on the show, but it was eight years ago, I think. But the the part that sticks out in my mind from it was like when he when Arnold Schwarzenegger kills James Earl Jones. Yeah, it's like weirdly artistic the way it's shot, where there's lots of like close ups of their faces and eyes and stuff, and that just like really sticks out in my mind. Just the sort of like weird, like art house moment yeah. in this, and that that whole thing, you know, in the temple with all the people and the and the lights. Uh, and then he just stands, he sits there on the steps with the head and, and it's just like, it's fantastic. It's got some great cheesy quotable lines in it too. Like the, the part where the guy is asking what are the best things in life and everybody's answering incorrectly. And Oh, it's fantastic. And, and Conan's like, these are the best things in life to see your enemies screaming driven before, before you, you hear driven the before you hear the, the lament. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, so good. No, it's a great line. I actually, that's one of the lines I still quote. Uh, you hear the yeah. lamentation of the women. It's fantastic. You hear the lamentation of the women. Get to the chopper. <laughs> and Sorry. you know, do you want to live forever? Um, the the, yeah. the that woman character whose name I can't remember is is uh, really inspired me. I was like, I want to be her. <laughs> but but yeah, so like I think the reason that Never Ending Story and Conan the Barbarian made my list. Conan the Barbarian because of like literally because of that moment, the like weird up like close ups of their faces at the end. A never-ending story because of yeah the, the this the city falling apart and the castle floating in space and the um, empress saying like he doesn't even real like I was with him you were with him when he ran into the bookshop it's like like there's just moments from those that stick out in my mind it's like yeah it's kind of give me chills thinking about them and then so many of these other movies I'm just kind of like ah uh, like sword and the sorcerer like I don't even remember really like nothing like sticks out from some a lot so many of these movies at all you know it's like I would have to go back and listen to our earlier episodes to even kind of remember like what they well, were about. I think most of them were terrible like sword and <laughs> yeah, sorcerer is yeah. terrible hawk the slayer terrible as much as I love Tolkien yeah. the return of the king is is really bad it's a terrible version of it dragon slayer eh, it's got its moments I do I it's it's a sentimental uh, I like it's in a sentimental way Excalibur, 
I like it. I don't like it. I don't think it's a good movie, but it's visually beautiful. Uh, heavy metal is just cool. Um, not a great story, but you know, time bandits. Yeah. Like I, Terry Gilliam, you know, uh, Beastmaster is just fun as hell. Um, Dark Crystal, I hate because I hate the puppets. Like it literally freaks me out. I cannot watch Dark Crystal. I hate the puppets in that I case. Hate them. I tried mm-hmm. watching the new one on at Netflix. I had to stop about, after about like fifteen minutes because I was so freaked out. They're just so freaky looking. Ooh. The new one I thought was actually really I, good. I thought it. I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I couldn't it watch out. it. I agree, Dave. It was like it was like Game of Thrones with creepy puppets. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It was. Yeah. It was. It was trying to be creepy though. It wasn't trying to be a, a kids thing. They're still, but they're still creepy. Like those puppets are just creepy. I mean, they were always creepy outside the story. Well, but I said like Muppets. I said Muppets creep me out, and I feel like everyone was like, "No, what Muppets?" Are great. Well, those Muppets. I mean, the the Dark Crystal Muppets are different than like Kermit yes. the Frog. I wouldn't, you know, Kermit no, the Frog doesn't if, creep me if, out. Did you ever watch the Alice in Wonderland episode of the Muppet Show? That's pretty. No, freaky. I've never seen that. Yeah, it's probably on YouTube. It's oh, pretty freaky. It. Yeah. No, I do love the Muppets. I absolutely love the Muppets. Yeah, I love Muppets too. Yeah. But the but some puppets creep me out. I think they were <laughs> supposed to though. I think they were supposed to. Uh, it's a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um Yeah. All right. I mean, we're pretty much out of time, so um I think we should start wrapping this up pretty soon. Um, I guess I'll also just say that, you know, this all started with Andrea just saying she wanted to talk about <laughs> bad 80s movies it's all your fault it's all it is fault. A, it is all my fault <laughs> this was awesome yeah yeah here we are you know so it's yeah i, I think we've done i don't know something like five or six episodes yeah. with you guys and then like one or two other ones with other people um but yeah this has been quite an adventure going through all these movies of which <laughs> like you know I, I i could like um unreservedly recommend princess bride yes and last unicorn and then you know then there's like 30 other movies that i don't know like uh if you're if you have you know i don't know say you're like a college student or something today and you have no particular interest in the 80s or 80s fantasy or anything like that i don't know if i could really in good conscience recommend (laughs) too many of these other movies to you but uh it was it was certainly fun for me having grown up with them uh going back and reliving them yeah for me as well agreed um all right why don't we wrap this up so uh any other final thoughts, Matt? Any other final thoughts on this whole 80s fantasy thing? Um, yeah, like I probably wouldn't have gone back and watched these films had I not, you know, had to for, for this these podcasts. And I'm really glad I did because it was just like brought me back to a certain time in my yeah. childhood. It was just like, you know, you, you go to the theater or you watch it, you know, at home and you're all in with the characters, you know, five minutes in you know, the the horse dies and you're weeping hysterically, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you're so emotionally invested. And it, it was just, um, it was a lot of fun and, and really cool to just go back and, and re- revisit, uh, revisit these movies. So that was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom, final thought. I agree with Matt. I, 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 I would have gone back and watch, rewatched my top five. I mean, I, I watched those movies once in a while, all of them. Um, you know, Time Bandits, Labyrinth, Princess Bride, Highlander, Conan, Conan the Barbarian. I go back and watch those from time to time. The other ones, I agree. I wouldn't have gone back and watched them again, but I am glad that I did. It was it was a lot of fun. Sometimes it was a little bit, um, you know, sometimes it was a little bit, as I mentioned in a previous episode, a little bit like being stuck in Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> yeah. Somebody trying to turn my brain to mush mm. by making me watch these terrible movies. Yeah. But I agree, it was a fun experience. And I hope some people get some new titles to watch out of it. And I hope we get to do something this fun again. It was super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, final thought? Uh, basically what everybody else said is that it, it, it brought me back to a time in my life where you know, I was open to anything. I didn't sit around um, analyzing. I was not, I didn't think about stuff. I just watched and I enjoyed. Uh, so that was a great experience of reliving, being, you know, having first experiences with stories and movies, um, being a kid again. Uh, so that's what this brought me back to. And, and I really love that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'll also just say, I mean, I love sword and sorcery so much and I'm so happy that I grew up Mm -hmm. with sword and sorcery. And yeah, like these movies overwhelmingly were not well done, but there's just something so awesome about the whole sword and sorcery thing. And it makes me sad that 
you know, the extent to which it's passed away. And I, I wish, you know, more new movies would do more like sword and sorcery and, and would, you know, take some of this, you know, this, this, this kind of story and do it better with modern, you know, modern pacing and modern special effects. Do you not think that uh, uh, Game of Thrones did that? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, Game of Thrones, yeah, I'm definitely glad that existed. I mean, and that's more like, that's sort of a mix of sword and sorcery yeah. and epic fantasy and historical fiction and stuff. Yeah. You know, it's it's not not it's not just like straight sword and sorcery, like you know, Conan the Barbarian style stuff. But no, yeah, I mean, but more stuff like that is is definitely definitely yeah. what I want. I mean, it's, I'm not saying there's none, but there's just not as much as I want, and probably not as well done. Yeah. Um, all right, but if anyone out there uh, wants to make a sword and sorcery movie and make it good, <laughs> yeah. this is this is a key point. Make it <laughs> make good. Make it good, yeah. Uh, if you, you want some I mean? creative consultants, you know, we're available. Yeah. I can write that script yeah. easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to hop on a call. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So let's uh, wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Andrea Kale, Tom Grenzer, and Matthew Kressel. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Andrea Kale, Tom Gorenzer, and Matthew Kressel for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.